Welcome to episode 119 of Radio 815, the podcast dedicated to examining the work of Reddit director J.J. Abrams, as well as his greater Bad Robot universe. I'm your host for this week. My name is Marcelo Inestroza, joined as always by my fellow co-host, Matt Crandall. And on today's edition of the show, we'll be discussing Fringe Season 4, Episodes 12 through 13. First up in that batch is the episode entitled, Welcome to Westfield. So, Matt, I haven't had an official driver's license since I got out of the mental institution. I love that moment where Walter is sitting down for a slice of rhubarb pie, and the guy that he's talking to thinks that he's telling him a hilarious joke. And we know this guy's not kidding around. And then shit gets real serious as stuff escalates in Welcome to Westfield that does have a very familiar conceit to it where Team Fringe goes to this town where some weird stuff is happening and as they try and leave the town, they just keep driving back through it and they can't get out. They are trapped in Westfield, which, as they mention in episode, is a trope that is used in Brigadoon, also in the Apple TV parody Schmigadoon, and also, it's been used countless times, but of note, right now, here in 2023, Jeff Pinkner is an EP on the show From, which is literally about people who get trapped in a small town and can't leave. So the whole time I was watching this episode, I was like, man, that dude must have really liked this idea that they explored in Welcome to Westfield because he's now part of an entire show that is about that. But the more exciting stuff that happens as this is going on. And what we establish early is that this town is affected by some sort of weird issue. And Peter's like, how could they do this? And Olivia says, well, don't you remember when all of those elephant people in a diner were in this town and there was a device that made it so we couldn't see them? Maybe a device similar to that is causing people to merge with like their alternate selves. And he goes, hold up. That's something that happened with my Olivia, not you. How? And they kind of like speed bump over this. And throughout the episode, we start to realize that this whole time we didn't know what Nina Sharp was doing. We knew that she was giving Olivia something, Cortex a fan, and knocking her out. And we knew that there was a communique last episode that said, you know, she's almost ready to start remembering. And we didn't know what it was referencing. But now, here, as this Olivia Dunham starts to merge with our beloved Olivia Dunham, in small glimpses, we can start connecting dots and drawing lines and thinking, this must have been what Nina Sharp was up to. But still, the greater question, fucking why? (laughs) So, Marcella, what are you thinking as this stuff starts to come to light heavily in this episode here? I really enjoy this episode so, so much because... Like you know, Matt, and like people who have been listening listening to us for a very, very long time, you guys know that I love barrel episodes where our main characters are stuck in one place and they can't get out of this one place for various reasons. Um, and I also love the opening sequence of this episode where Walter is in the diner talking to the guy that owns the diner. And for some... F- for some weird reason I kept looking at the guy's eyes and the guy's eyes look so goddamn weird it was like is he high or is that like a a a trick of the light that uh that was caught during the filming of this episode I'm like no that can't be it and eventually when Walter orders a piece of pie and then after a couple minutes the waiter who owns the restaurant, asks Walter the same question again. I'm like, wait a minute, something isn't right here. And then eventually uh, the waiter attacks Walter and Peter saves him. So that whole setup, I really, really love that whole setup to introduce the mystery of this episode. And also I love that Walter asked for a piece of pie, but I was like, dude, all you need to ask for is a cup of coffee now. Come on, let's get a Twin Peaks reference in here. I need one. And we definitely get some Twin Peak vibes from that diner. And there also was that episode where Peter runs away and he goes to that small town and has that 
fling with the waitress at a diner that this really felt like. But I loved that early in the episode, Astrid's radioing to Walter because this is the Walter who doesn't go in the field and doesn't hang out with us on missions. And then he he's speaking right behind her and he rolls in and he's like, yeah, now that I'm expanding my comfort zone and we learn that because he's been helping Peter and trying to understand this, Walter's really coming around and coming into his own. And so I love that he is on the ground with the team as they get trapped in Westfield because we do get that fun diner scene that then turns scary with the dude with the double irises. But then also as they're investigating, we can have Walter do the blood work and all the fringy sci-fi science babble bullshit without having to just cut to John Noble by himself on a telephone. So I love that finally Walter is hanging out with everybody. And as they start to realize that, you know, that guy had two irises and everybody's getting like this weird dementia where they're getting schizophrenia and they're having dual lives in like different moments, 30 second bursts of my husband's dead. My husband's at work. Um, I, I think that's really cool. And especially because we have seen back when the universe war was in full swing, the episode where the dude merged with himself and died because the two hymns and that we've, we come to realize that's kind of what's happening here. And they have to realize what is causing that. And you know, the lady with two sets of teeth is disgusting. And they realize that there are people who aren't affected are because their doppelgangers in the alternate universe are not in the same spot. And I thought that was really fascinating that we're going back to a couple of greatest hits kind of ideas and weaving them together in a new way in this remix timeline, as you like to call it. And I think that that's kind of interesting where we can revisit certain cases that we are familiar with. So we don't have to spend a whole lot of time on the mumbo jumbo because we get it because we have the experience from the season two episode or the season three episode that's similar. And that gives us more time to then focus on the characters where Peter is worried and he doesn't clock exactly what's happening with Olivia, but he gets Walter to test her blood because he's like, obviously you're being affected in the same way. And by the end, when they're, you know, trying to fix the town and make it so that they can leave and that the two worlds are not colliding. And, you know, we get the cool scene that we have had before where things kind of appear and disappear out of the horizon. Walter says, actually, I I ran Olivia's blood and she doesn't have this DNA marker thing that everybody else has. So what's happening to her has nothing to do what's happening to Westfield. And there's a funny moment where he, he, he Olivia thinks like she's in trouble and going to die because Walter doesn't spit it all out right away. But then realizing that Peter still doesn't want to acknowledge quite what is happening even though we only get the small glimpses in the final scene of this episode, we get the big glimpse where it becomes entirely clear because after they have solved this mystery with the town, Peter goes to visit Olivia and he walks in and she is full 100% old Olivia. She's got wine for them. She's ordered dinner from their favorite place. She gives him a big kiss and she's like, you know, welcome home. And he's like, what in the absolute fuck? is happening. So I'm cheering and super excited that finally we are going to somehow do a reset. And I'm excited that they realize, you know, all the stuff that went on with the town is somehow still David Robert Jones and the other shapeshifters orchestrating something. And they don't know exactly the reason, but if it gets me old Olivia back in some capacity, I'm fine with it. Let me ask you this. Why do you think, the French writers, for some reason, the French writers have have revisited old, old storylines from old episodes that have already happened for us. But they've revisited they've revisited these storylines in the remix timeline. But why do you think that half of those ideas didn't work and this did like like why do they why do they constantly why do they constantly uh, shovel out shit before they shovel out genius in the second half. Why do they do that? 
<laughs> That's a good way to put it. And I think it's just that they agreed to this conceit at the start of the season. Like in this new remix timeline, we're going to do some of the greatest hits and we're going to put a twist on them to see how these cases of the week play out in this new timeline. But the thing that makes this one work, like you said, it's the fun of a bottle episode and the fact that this one we have more interesting character beats for our main characters. Because I think a lot of the other episodes where they've done these remix things, I've been frustrated by the character beats because we were still dealing with other Olivia, other Walter, and seeing how they dealt with that. Whereas I like the familiar Walter and the familiar Olivia and getting at least part of that dynamic back with Peter and Olivia in this makes it work better for me. But I also think that that conceit of, you know, we're stuck in a town and we can't leave is just a fun one that works a lot of the time. The other question that I have before the other question that I have for you before we move on to the second episode that we're going to talk about this week, when 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 Peter first came to this remix timeline, he was very, very he was very, very upfront in trying to convince everyone that he was the Peter that they remembered, even when they didn't remember Peter. But now that Olivia's mind seems to be seems to be rejiggering in the place, he seems to be worried. He seems to be not into it. Why do you think he seems to be not into it when I would assume that he would be very into it? Or 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 or, or did I just miss something here? You didn't miss something. And so in this episode, we just get that final scene where the look on his face is kind of like, huh, what's going on here? And it is in episode 13, A Better Human Being, where he is totally, I don't like this and I need to figure out what is going on. And so I was cheering at the end of Welcome to Westfield and I was fucking booing from the rafters in episode 13 because this is not the response Peter Bishop should have to his Olivia Dunham's memories coming into this Olivia. He should not care that it is not technically his Olivia because if she has the experiences in her mind, to me, that is what makes the person, their collected memories and experiences. And when he is dragging his feet, I was so fucking mad at him the entire episode because, dude, what the fuck are you doing? All right, guy. All right, man. So uh, with that being said, we move on to the final episode that we're going to talk about this week. Matt already preemptively said it. Uh, the episode is entitled A Better Human Being. So, Matt, uh, I hear a million voices in my head. <laughs> and are are they all speaking weird crimes that they're doing and talking about subway traffic? I I thought that this was kind of, again, you know, that ghost network thing that we talked about a few episodes ago where the girl could tap into these uh, premonitions. And also in that ghost network episode, that guy could tap into people's communications through it. And it feels like that's what this kid is kind of doing. Now we don't full on say that because we just did the ghost network remix three episodes ago, but it's very similar. And I do like how this episode's mystery of the week draws out a lot of Walter's own experiences with being in St. Clair's and the way that people are quick to diagnose conditions incorrectly because it's easier and they just assume someone is crazy rather than trying to dig into what's happening. So I love that. But as I said in the preamble, the fact that Peter is not ecstatic, that Olivia's mind is now the old Olivia that we love, and the fact that she is having feelings for him, that he just doesn't grab her and kiss the shit out of her made me so angry. And he's like, let's hook you up. His first impulse when she's like, hey, baby, welcome home, is let me hook you up to machines and find out why you're acting this way. And I'm like, dude, no, this is the reunion we have been waiting for. And if this is the only way Fringe is going to give it to me, I'm willing to take it. So what are you thinking as Peter is dragging his heels and wants to hook her up to machines to see what's wrong with her? And I'm thinking, hook Peter up to those machines. What's wrong with him? No, I really like 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 you. I kind of didn't understand it because, like I said, at, at the tail end of the last episode that we uh, just talked about, when when Peter first came into this remix timeline, he was extremely concerned with trying to make. Olivia, Walter, Astrid, Broyles. He was extremely concerned with trying to make everybody remember him. So it doesn't make sense to me 
when our Livia's memories are rejerking back into place, like I said before, why he would act this way. The only thing that I'm possibly, the only thing that I can think of that he's possibly worried about is that maybe she got taken over by something that isn't, you know, copacetic or by the numbers. But if she got taken over by something, I'm, I'm pretty sure Walter could figure out a way to fix it. I would hope. I think my, my only thing that I was thinking was that it might be faux Livia PTSD where he thinks if I fall in love with this woman and then somehow my Olivia does come back, I'm going to be the same fucking idiot who did the same fucking thing twice where I fell in love with the wrong version of my girlfriend and she's going to be mad at me. So that was the only thing that was kind of in the back of my mind. And it sort of hit home with the the concluding scenes of this episode, which I don't want to jump ahead too much, but that was something that I kind of think is maybe where the writers were coming from. And yeah, he does say like, he's worried that this is some sort of weird, you know, nefarious thing that has happened that if her memories are back, maybe somebody has included some non-authentic things that are then going to turn her into like a Manchurian candidate and they're going to be able to snap their fingers and have her assassinate everyone or something. But I just going from so happy that we were finally moving into the part that I wanted to happen halfway through the season to then being so angry that everybody is like, well, we can't, we can't have this stand. And I'm like, (laughs) everyone watching this show, this is all they want is for, the good Olivia Dunham to be back. No offense, remix Olivia Dunham. You were fine, but you were not the good one. <laughs> In my mind, the the one that we have all the experience with is the good one. And so the fact that her demeanor and, you know, props to Anna Torv, when these memories do come back, you can see a change in her demeanor, even just the way she looks at Peter, her face, her posture, everything kind of switches a little bit. And it feels more familiar to what we know. And I'm just like, That's what we want. Let's just fucking throw a party and run with it and be like, guys, we did it. We reset Olivia. We'll worry about resetting Walter later. Who gives a fuck? But the ship is back on. Let's fucking go. You mentioned that Anator does a great job in in distincting uh, remix Olivia from our Olivia. And I did notice in various scenes in this episode when Olivia was trying to get a rise out of Peter because Peter in this episode is very monotone. He's very, very worried and concerned for no apparent reason at all. I don't understand why, but I love that when Anator, Anator walks in most scenes, her shoulders are a little bit lower. Her face is a little bit more brighter. She, she does these little things with her facial expressions that I just absolutely love. There's two scenes in this episode where I just went nuts. First of all, I love the quick scene when Peter convinces Olivia to 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 go under a machine to 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 uh, to do a brain scan on her. And the machine that Walter puts her in, I don't know why. I got Doc Brown flashbacks of of him wearing the 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 thing on his head and them sticking the plunger on Marty's forehead and going, "I'm going to read your thoughts." And, and I'm like, why, why, why am I getting these vibes? I have, I had no idea why I was getting those vibes. And the other scene that I loved very, very much is when uh, Walter, Peter, and Olivia are going through the mental institution, and Olivia is having flashbacks to the pilot. And while when while Olivia is having these flashbacks, you see images from the pilot, and you hear die, and you hear dialogue from the pilot i love the way that the right that the writers and the director handled those scenes because they just felt great to me i don't don't know i don't know what it was i just have nostalgia for the first season of fringe i think for sure and i think that that nostalgia again this whole remix timeline where we're like revisiting certain greatest hits they have committed to that this season where we're gonna flashback or remix our our stuff to give that dopamine hit of of kind of the member berries of like, oh yeah, that. But that's an instance where it seems to work pretty good. I thought the mystery of the week was fine. You know, they uncover the fact that this fertility doctor ended up 
using the same stuff in like a million people and that the kid who could tap in, it was all basically his brothers and sisters that he could hear because they were all through this same fertilization doctor. And then when the doctor is dead, they fix it. Like the kid, the kid is fine. And I was like, okay, this is, this is fine. But the, the stuff I cared about more was Olivia, but also as we're going along, Walter realizes somebody must have been fucking around with Cortexafan. And he's like, but this is impossible because all the Cortexafan should be locked up in Massive Dynamics vault. And he's like, I got to get on the phone and figure out what the fuck's going on here. So he calls up Nina Sharp and she's like, nope, look, all the Cortexafan's here. It's perfect. And Walter being Walter, he's not going to take anything at face value without tasting that shit. So I love that he looks at it and he tastes it and he's like, no, this is just food coloring. And he's like, somebody, and he's looking directly at Nina and he's like, somebody has used this cortexafan and replaced this with fake cortexafan. So I think you better start explaining yourself. And I love that moment because we have been waiting for someone to confront Nina and figure out now that we know she was the big bad. We're still trying to figure out why. Why is she working with David Robert Jones? Why is she helping the shapeshifters? And in the coda, the very last scene of this episode, we do find out why. But I love that moment where Walter confronts her and the fake Cortexafan. What are you thinking as he goes down and demands to see the samples that him and Belly left in that, that lab? That scene where... Lincoln, my guy Lincoln. Yes, yes, yes. I love Lincoln, guys. You know this. My guy Lincoln. And Walter go down to Massive Dynamic to confront Nina and to ask her about the Cortex event. I absolutely loved that scene. But throughout that entire scene, as Nina was walking them down to the vault where they actually had the Cortex event, which is a really cool, it's like this, it's like these little tiny vaults against the wall. It's really, really cool. The the uh, the production design of Fringe has always been top notch, and they've always managed to make the most evil company in Bad Robot look awesome. Because Massive Dynamic is the most evil company in Bad Robot, without without a question. Um, anyway, I wanted Lincoln to arrest that woman. Throughout the whole scene, I was like, dude, if you're gonna go down there and if you're gonna accuse her, arrest her. Do do not let her. Do not let her spin some bullshit that both Walter and you know isn't real. But then with the last scene of this episode, I'm thinking, wait a minute. Is the Nina that caused all of this the other one? Is not our Nina, but is, the, is it the other Nina from the other side? Because have we ever seen her before? When we do get to that very end and Olivia wakes up in a basement tied captive and Nina is across from her. And she says, don't worry, we're going to be fine. We just got to ride this out. We start to wonder, I start to wonder two things. Is this Nina, who's at Massive Dynamic with Walter right now, the other side's Nina Sharp, or is this a shapeshifter who has taken over and done all of this bad shit and explains why she is working with David Robert Jones and why a mother would dose her own daughter? Oh, wow. I go, oh, wow. I love the way you put that together because I... I had I had no inclination that the Nina that we've been seeing for the for, for this whole time is a shapeshifter. I, I actually wasn't thinking that angle at all. Like I was thinking that well well you know what I was thinking, I just said it, but that was that that's an amazing theory. So certainly in the moment that's what I'm thinking. We'll see how it plays out, what they decide to do, but it definitely we we've really railed on Nina for being decept deceptive and not a good protector. And I do like that that was all intentional because there were bigger red flags that we just didn't see on the field until now. And I thought that was really well done because it makes those other episodes play better in retrospect. I will say of giant fuck you to the writers, though, <laughs> about the fact that Peter and Olivia have a great scene in a car where they are talking about the fact that they had this life and Olivia now remembers it. And Peter is looking into her eyes and he's like, you know, the big thing with faux Olivia and our Olivia was that Olivia couldn't understand how Peter couldn't tell. And she's like, it's in the eyes. That guy who made the marionette chick 
He could tell by the eyes. And in this one, Peter says, like, I actually look into your eyes and I can tell it's you. I can see that you are my Olivia. And they share finally like a nice kiss where they're like going to be together. We're like, yes, this is awesome. And then Olivia goes, I got to go take a piss. Let me go into this mysterious gas station by myself. And you just wait here. And I'm like, (laughs) record scratch. Are you kidding me? That's what we're doing. Olivia Dunham has to go pee and can't hold it till they get home in this super romantic moment. She's just like, hold up, bro. I got to take a whiz. And I'm like, no. And so of course she disappears and she's gone and kidnapped. And that's where we end the episode. What are you thinking as that's what we do? Olivia Dunham gets abducted while taking a piss. I really, I really liked that scene for the most part. All throughout the episode, Peter has been very, very reluctant to accept this new version of Olivia, this new version of Olivia, and accept that this version of, of Olivia is our version of Olivia. So I was really happy that he said, "Oh, I can tell it's you because because I'm looking at your eyes and I trust my instincts and I know that this is the right thing." And there. And then they kiss, they make out, which makes all all Olivia and Peter shippers like me go nuts. But that moment when Olivia says, oh, hold up, I got to take a leak. I was like, I couldn't stop laughing because I was like, this is the most absurd excuse to get Olivia away from Peter and then kidnap her. I mean, if 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 the if the fringe writers wanted to do that, why don't they have them? leave the gas station, get into a car accident, then have these guys take Olivia, and then that's it. That that is much better. I mean, I don't know if they had the budget at the time, but that would have worked much better. The only thing that I liked about Peter entering the gas station and then exiting the gas station is that stuck on the gas station window is a advertisement for Slusho. And if you guys love Bad Robot Slusho, is a hallmark. Slusher is a big giant Easter egg within the Bad Robot universe. So I love that. But I, like you, I hated the way that the writers handled Olivia being taken from Peter, especially after such an important moment. A moment that, like you said, that you, I, and a bunch of other friends have been waiting for. And I know they might not have had the budget for like a big Olivia gets abducted scene, but even... Uh, you want anything to drink? Yeah, I'll take a, a slush show. Peter goes in to get the drinks when he comes back. Olivia's gone. Or Olivia, I will pump the gas. Why don't you go in and whatever? And she starts to pump the gas. And when he comes back, she's gone. Or even she gets out to pump the gas and then just never comes around the side of the car. And he looks in the mirror. Where did she go? So like anything but this romantic moment. And I got to take a piss. I'm like, no, the writers are taking the piss. This is unbelievable. I can't believe they did that to us. But other than that, uh, two enjoyable episodes that finally are trying to get Fringe back to the status quo that I like. The last thing I will say before we wrap up this week's episode is one thing that re- one thing that is really inconsequential, but it really bothered the shit out of me. The mother of the of the little of, of the teenager that is connected to his brothers and the, and the, and the main conduit, the the kid that can hear everything. His mother eventually shows up to the mental institution when Peter and Olivia tell him that he tell his mother that he's not actually suffering from schizophrenia. He has this condition because of the way that he was born. His mother is the most useless character ever because Astrid is the one that is spending most of, is is interacting with him in the institution and his fucking mother is in the background without doing anything. I'm like, why are you here? Totally know, useless. Guys. Totally know, useless but... and very frustrating. Yeah. Anyway, that just pissed. That just that just took the piss out of me. I I, I was like, why is she here? Just remove her. Just j- just say that he was an orphan or something. It, there's like there's like a million ways to fix this, but I don't know, guys. It was just that was a tiny little thing that really bugged the crap out of me. So. On that note, guys, uh, that'll do it uh, for this edition of Radio 815. Listen, guys, if you like anything that we do here and you want to reach out to us, there are various ways to reach out to us. 
First, you can reach out to us on Twitter by just simply using the hashtag Radio815. You can reach out to us on our personal Twitter. It's JJUniverse815. Or you can reach out to me personally on Twitter. I'm at CreekFanatic88. But Matt, if the good folks at home want to reach out to you, what would be the best place for them to do that on? On Twitter, at Matt Crandall. All right, guys. So uh, with all that being said, until next time, as always, we'll talk back soon. Radio 815 is a Balloonhead Productions presentation in association with Killer Newt Productions.